It's good to be with you again this morning. Um, we are going to be continuing this week uh, in the book of Genesis. We aren't uh, veering off the, the beaten path this week, um, so I do uh, consider it uh, you know, an honor and a privilege to carry on where Pastor Nate left us off last week. We're going to be looking at Genesis 46 and 47. Um, so again, it's going to be a fairly lengthy passage, all things considered. And as we've done the last few weeks, we are not going to do what we usually do, which is read the, the entire text up front. We are going to be taking it uh, kind of bits and pieces as we go. Uh, so with that said, because we do have quite a bit to work through, uh, let's open in prayer and, uh, and get right to it. <clears throat> Lord, uh, please teach us what you would have uh, for us to learn this morning from your word. May it be a blessing to each person here. Um, to, uh, to the young, to the old, to everyone in between. Uh, may we go out uh, with what you bless us with here to bless the world around us. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Give us life according to your word this morning. Amen. So if you could open your Bibles to Genesis 46. Uh, we'll begin reading. We'll read the first few verses here at the start. Verse 1, so Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. So it's very easy for us when we uh, are, are coming here kind of week by week, uh, taking one story at a time from the book of Genesis or from any, any book in the Bible, any narrative, uh, to, to uh, kind of lose our place in the larger story. Right? We can take things for granted. We can downplay the significance of of some of the things that are going on. So I want to, very quickly, give sort of a, a, a summation of the book of Genesis up to this point, because what we're about to read in chapters 46 and 47 are basically the culmination of the entire story up to this point, all right? So we have in the very beginning, God creating all things through the power of his word. And he creates man, to be his representatives, his image bearers on earth. And then we have man falling into sin. We have the curse of sin. And then we have the promise of redemption in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And shortly after that, we have brother murdering brother. We have God providing Adam and Eve with a new son. And then, again, shortly after that, we have the descent of the world into so great a sin that God needs to wipe man off the face of the earth with a flood, except for a single family who was descended from that son whom God provided Adam and Eve. And then almost immediately, again, we have man rebelling against God at the Tower of Babel, okay, trying to make their own mountain to the heavens. And so the nations are scattered and from one of those nations in the east, a nation called Ur, God calls Abram. And he calls Abram to be the means by which he would further his purposes on earth, the means by which he would uh, carry out the promise of the, the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent, right? And from uh, Abram is then promised that from his loins would come many nations, people who would be God's people. But of course, Abram and his wife are old, and she is barren, and so they try to circumvent God's promise through Hagar. But even through their sin, God opens Sarai's womb, and she bears Isaac, and so the promise lives on. Until, of course, God asks Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. But then God provides a substitute, and Isaac lives on. And then Isaac receives the same promise from God as Abraham, that his descendants, God's people, would be as numerous as the stars. And then eventually from Isaac, we have Jacob and Esau. 
The younger one promised to be the one through whom God would continue his plan for mankind, right? The one from whom the seed of the woman would come from. And yet, once again, we have this time Isaac and Esau working to circumvent God's plan by attempting to give the blessing of the covenant to the wicked older brother Esau. And once, we get, once again, though, we have God providing a way, but the result is that Jacob has to flee, right? And he ends up living with his uncle who tricks him and deceives him and uh, uses him. But after many years of service, Jacob returns to the promised land with a couple of wives and some children and many riches. And God reiterates to him the same promise that his father received, that his grandfather received, that his descendants would be numerous, and he would become not just a nation, but a company of nations. So eventually, Jacob has 12 sons. His favorite son from his favorite wife is killed, or at least that's what he thought. And the rest of his sons turn out to be kind of scoundrels. Um, They're murderous, they're promiscuous, they are jealous, they're liars. And now, finally, there's a famine. A famine in the land that's so severe that if they do not go down to Egypt to beg for food, they will all die. And so that's what they do. They go down to beg for food. And when they do, the prime minister who is in charge of handing out the food takes one of Jacob's sons prisoner and demands that they return with their youngest brother. And this brother, Benjamin, was the son whom God blessed Jacob with as a replacement for Joseph in the first place. So in Jacob's mind, at this point, all is lost. Okay, he has failed, his family will die, and his descendants will never inherit the promised land of God. They will never be able to bless the nations. The seed of the woman is going to have to come from somewhere else. And then we have the remarkable turn of events that we looked at last week. Right? It, begins, it begins with Judah stepping up. Okay, Judah begins to take responsibility for his sin. He's the one that begins to reconcile the sons of Jacob with, you know, to each other. And then in the greatest turn of events, we have the prime minister of Egypt revealing himself to be, of course, no surprise for us, Joseph, the dead son of Jacob. And so the brothers return to tell Jacob this news, right? Jake, uh, Joseph is alive. We are saved. God is provided. Joseph is preparing Uh, a place for us in Egypt. And this is where we pick up the story. At the point, at this this hinge point of where everything is lost, the promises are are broken, there's, you're right, we're all going to die, there's no way that things will, will go on the way that God has said, and then in an instant, on a dime, things are flipped and hope is restored. And so one has to wonder what Jacob thought in this very moment. Right, when all of this information is revealed to him by his sons, uh, to find out that his beloved son is still alive after all of these years, that his other ten sons this entire time have been lying to him and deceiving him and are the cause of all of this pain and anguish and loss that he's been experiencing, I am sure that there are additional conversations not recorded in the book of Genesis Uh, that probably took place on a very awkward wagon ride down to Egypt. But, nonetheless, Jacob believes the report of his sons, and he has faith, and he makes this journey down to Egypt, right? Very much in the same way that Abram, uh, his grandfather, did as he journeyed to a foreign country not knowing exactly what would be in store for him. And then God confirms for Jacob this decision, right? In a vision, he says, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. I will bring you up again, he says. But this is clearly in reference to Jacob's descendants, not Jacob himself. Jacob is incredibly old at this moment, and he knows that this is his last journey. Jacob is well aware that he is leaving the promised land for the last time. He is never again going to see the land of Canaan. He is never going to see God's promises fulfilled to his children and his grandchildren. And yet he has faith and he goes. 
So verse 5, it says, Then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, their little ones, and their wives in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters. All his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. So Jacob is so old and feeble that they literally have to carry him up onto uh, the wagons that have been prepared for, for he and his family to, to make this journey. And this is a complete move, okay? This is not a temporary, uh, you know, trip down to Egypt. This is, there. everything is going. Sons, daughters, wives, children, grandchildren, wealth, servants, livestock, everything is making this journey. And so what we're going to see next is the list of descendants of Jacob who went into Egypt from Canaan. For time's sake, we're not going to read the whole list, also for the sake of me not having to rattle off all the names, but rather we are going, I'm just going to read the conclusion, the last couple of verses, uh, and then point out a few things. So we're going to skip all the way down to, uh, to verse 26. And it says this, it says, All the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt, who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's sons' wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. 70. So if you look at the list here, we have all the children of Jacob listed according to uh, they're listed based on the, the, the wives of Jacob, uh, and it's his children and also his children's children who are listed. And in the end, as we just read, the list totals 70 people in all who make this trip from Canaan down to Egypt. But what's interesting about this list is that if we take this list literally, just completely on face value, uh, it is wildly inaccurate. Uh, clearly, there were many more than 70 people who made this journey. Okay, for instance, only one daughter of Jacob uh, is listed. That's Dinah. Uh, even though a few verses earlier, it literally says daughters of Jacob. And then apparently, again, if taken literally, we have one granddaughter listed and 55 grandsons. Um, a pretty remarkable ratio if, um, if that is to be, to be taken literally. But I mean, again, I, just for, uh, I, I suppose, right, if God is the one involved here, uh, then sure, it's not impossible, I suppose, for, a, you know, for Jacob to have had 55 grandsons and one granddaughter. But that's not the only reason that I, I think it's, it's inaccurate. Two of Benjamin's sons that are listed, uh, the two with the very best names, uh, if you look at verse 21, uh, which are Muppim and Huppim, uh, these are actually literal. Uh, uh, plural forms of those names. Okay, so the, the, the Hebrew ending im, I am in English, uh, is, is the plural form in Hebrew. So you think just, uh, for example, right, you have seraph, the, the plural form of seraph is seraphim. You have cherub, the plural form being cherubim. So these are not individual people. These are actually people groups. Okay, so the sons of Benjamin were actually Mup and Hup, which just makes it even better. But Muppim and Huppim then are, the, are the, the people that came from Mup and Hup. And it gets even worse if you're trying, again, if you're trying to read this literally, as a, as a, as a the, you're trying to read this genealogy of literally the people who made this trip, Mup and Hup and all the other children of Benjamin were not even born at this point. Okay, Benjamin likely isn't even married at this time. So what on earth is going on here? Why is this then the list that's given of the people who went down from Canaan to Egypt? If it's not correct, if it's not accurate. Well, the key is the, the final number that's given, which is the number 70. Okay, this is not a literal list of the people who went down to Egypt with Jacob, but rather it's a stylized literary device that the author is giving us to say something significant about 
Jacob and his family. Okay, so me saying that this is inaccurate might make some of you a little uncomfortable, and that's a good thing, um, because we do believe in the infallibility of Scripture, okay? We, we believe that Scripture contains no errors, right? And that even though copied many times by many people for, you know, many generations, we believe that what we are reading in front of us is what was originally written by the authors, so, if we, if we believe this, we also believe that we should take the Bible literally then, right? So the problem is, the Bible is not just a textbook spitting out information at us. Okay, it's more like the richest tapestry of literature um, that you could, ever, you could never fully mine the depths of. So when we say we, we read the Bible literally, it means that we have to read it how it's literally intended to be read. Okay, so we read narrative like it's narrative, and we read poetry like it's poetry, and we read imperative like it's imperative, and so forth. And so this list, although the information on its face seems inaccurate, it was never intended to be a factual list of the people who went from Canaan to Egypt, and so we shouldn't read it that way. It was literally meant to tell us something completely different. So why then... Did the writer go through so much effort, jump through so many hoops to make sure that he got to the number 70? Well, if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at the first couple chapters of the book of Judges, and we encountered a king named Adonai Bezek, and he was ruling over 70 kings. And we talked about how the number 70 is used in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis as representative of the nations of the world. Okay, this is a very significant number in Genesis. So by ruling over 70 kings, we saw that Bezek was being shown to be a world ruler. Okay, he ruled over the nations of the world. This first pops up in Genesis 10, uh, what's often called the Table of Nations passage. And it's just the list of the nations of the world that descended from Noah after the flood. And, and eventually those nations uh, come together at Babel and, and then they're scattered all over the world after the fall of Babel. And so here we have Jacob and his family being listed as 70. And you probably remember Jacob's second name, right? The name that God uh, gave him, that he renamed him as, and which is Israel. And what's interesting about this list, again, is at the very beginning, this is not uh, said to be the descendants of Jacob, but specifically the descendants of Israel. And so what we are seeing is the culmination of the entire storyline, the, the arc of the story of the patriarchs, right? God's plan to make Abraham a father of many nations, his promise to Isaac, to make his descendants as numerous as the stars, his promise to Jacob that he would become a company of nations, right? All of these things are coming true in this moment. Israel, this is your first point here, Israel has become a nation. And not just any nation, but a nation of 70, a nation of nations, okay? 70 representing all the nations of the world. So this is foreshadowing for us the truth that will be expounded upon throughout the rest of the Old Testament and then really hit home in the New Testament that God's plan for Israel was never for them to be a singular, insulated nation, right? They were to be a nation of nations, a nation that would be a blessing to all the other nations of the world and bring them into the fold of God's people as well. Verse 28 says, He had sent Judah, that's Jacob, he had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before him in Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. So it's interesting here to note that the leadership role um, that's given to Judah here, uh, we, can, we can see where it comes from. If we remember last week, again, we, Judah finally is the one, the one of the brothers that takes responsibility for his own sin. He takes the lead in 
uh, reconciling the sons of Jacob. And so now, right away, this increased level of responsibility results in increased level of leadership. Right? He is the one that Jacob sends to go and prepare the way. He is the one uh, that, that is given this, this great uh, responsibility, this great leadership role. And so we saw, of course, many, many times over the last uh, 10 chapters or so in the story of Joseph, um, that jo- you know, Joseph was doing this all the time, right? Um, more responsibility leading to increased levels of leadership. And so the point is leadership flows to those who take responsibility. Leadership flows to those who take responsibility. And this is same as, same as it was then is true today, right? Are you, are you grumbling about not getting that promotion at work or not getting that raise at work? Are you uh, maybe a teen or, or a young lady, young man living at home with your parents and uh, you're kind of frustrated that mom and dad won't let you do certain things? Are you a husband this morning grumbling about your wife not uh, following your lead, respecting you, right? The direction in God's economy is always that leadership naturally flows to those who take responsibility. So at work, right, take the extra shift, go the extra mile, work a little bit harder. Then you might get that promotion. Frankly, if you don't do that, you don't deserve it. It's as simple as that. Uh, kids, With mom and dad, right? Maybe you want a later curfew. Maybe you're looking to buy that first car. You're looking for some extra freedom. Whatever it is, right? Have you considered making your bed in the morning? Or helping with the dishes? Or helping with your younger siblings? Right? Take some responsibility. That will lead to more, you know, leadership given given to you. Husbands. Same thing, right? Take responsibility. Repent of your sin and ask for forgiveness from God, from your wife. Lead in this way first, and then leadership in other areas will flow from that. So all I'm trying to say is that leadership comes to those who take responsibility. You can't expect it otherwise, and it flows in a very specific direction, which is little to much. And so this is what happens with Judah. And, and this will actually uh, culminate next week when all the sons are being blessed by Jacob and Judah is given the blessing of becoming the royal tribe, right? The tribe from whom the scepter shall never depart and eventually the Messiah would even come from, right? So talk about little to much, right? A little bit of faithfulness leading to much. And so you never know where God will direct that tiny little seed of faithfulness, Verse 29 says, Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. And Joseph said to his brothers, to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household, who were in the land of Canaan, have come to me. And the men are shepherds. For they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So I have a difficult time putting myself in Jacob's shoes here. Um, I can't really fathom the emotion of thinking your son to be dead for many years, uh, then being not only reunited with him, but finding out that he is one of the most powerful men in the world and is the cause of the salvation of not just you, but your entire family. Uh, I, and you can even see in the text the overflow of emotion in Jacob. It says that he, he wept on Joseph's neck for a good while. And then when he stops, he says, essentially, like, I, I can die now. Right? Like, this, if, I, if, I, if, if this is it, if I die now, I would be a happy man. And then once again, we see Joseph being very wise and very shrewd And he figures out a way to get his father's entire household 
a choice allotment of territory within Egypt that would also provide a separation for them, right? So they would have a place, a very fruitful place, where they could be fruitful and multiply and increase, but still remain Israel, kind of an in-the-world-but-not-of-the-world situation. And so the start of chapter 47, let's, let's keep reading, says, So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, My father and my brothers with their flocks. Okay, so this is uh, Joseph's now going in. Everything that he told his brothers to do, uh, they're now coming in, and and we're going to reiterate that. He says, uh, My father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers, he took five men, and he presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, as our fathers were. They said to Pharaoh, we have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. So Joseph, he's now, uh, he's bringing five of his brothers in uh, kind of as a representative to see Pharaoh, and they do, and they say exactly what Joseph told them to do and say, and Pharaoh not only gives them the land of Goshen to dwell in, but he takes a look at these brothers, and you can imagine, you, you, you think about, he, you know, he's had Joseph by his side, um, blessing his kingdom, doing all these wonderful things for the kingdom of Egypt for a couple of years now, and he's thinking all the things that Joseph was able to accomplish, and and, and he sees these five other brothers, and he's probably thinking, if these guys are half as competent as Joseph, right, then not only can they raise their flocks in the land of Goshen, but they can have, they can raise all of mine too. And so that's what happens. They're, They're put in charge of Pharaoh's livestock. And so here we witness the culmination of all of Joseph's hard work his reliability, his wisdom, his skill, his counsel, right? Everything that Joseph has done and suffered through his basically entire life has led up to this point. And we see this principle, we saw it a second ago with Judah, right? That, that leadership flows to those who take responsibility. Well, now we see it even more so here with Joseph, right? He spent years being faithful to God and to Pharaoh and to Potiphar and to the jailers, And when the time has come for his family to be in need of literal salvation, like they will die if somebody doesn't step up, he is in the position to walk into the most powerful man in the world and make a request like, can my family have the best part of Egypt? And and it's granted, right? Literally no one except for Joseph on earth could have done this. And so for whatever reason, many of us have a tendency to separate different parts of our lives into categories such as uh, like sacred and secular, right? That God cares about certain parts of my life over here and maybe he doesn't care or at least doesn't care as much about certain things over here like, like church attendance and Bible reading and prayer and evangelism and those kind of things over here. Those are the mo- you know, God really cares about those, but over here, like, you know, seeking wisdom and, and building skills and, 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 and these very practical things that God just doesn't really care about that stuff as much. The problem is, it, thinking that way, is that Joseph here, that the means by which Joseph is able to save his entire family is almost entirely these very practical Christian living things over here. Um, and so we can't, we can't separate these two things, right? God, uh, God is concerned and, and we are as reliant on God for all the things over here as we are for all the things in this category over here as well. And God uses both. Uh, they're both very important. Now, Pastor Nate has mentioned a few times um, as we've gone through the entire book of Genesis, uh, the importance and the prevalence of chiastic literary structures in in Genesis. So um, chapters 46 and 47 are another one of these chiasms, and the center of that chiasm, 
which you should know by now is the, kind of the most important central theme of, of the section, is found here at the beginning of verse 7. So let us read this next section together. It says, Then Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Then Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food according to the number of their dependents. So Joseph has already brought in some of his brothers to see Pharaoh. Now he's bringing in his kind of very aged father, Jacob. And Pharaoh takes one look at him. And the first thing he says is, how many are the days of the years of your life? Uh, kind of in other words, like, how old are you? Like, he's a very, very old man at this point. And we find out that Jacob is 130 years old. And yet, he laments that he has not attained the long life of either his grandfather Abraham or his father Isaac. All right, so the further and further we get from the pre-flood world where we're we kind of we get used to these um, very long lifespans in the book of Genesis, but at this point, by the time we get here to the life of Jacob, him being 130 years old is incredibly old. But the important part here is that Jacob, right, Israel, the one who struggles with God, uh, <clears throat> blesses Pharaoh, and he blesses him not once, but twice. And Pharaoh, the most powerful ruler in the world, accepts these blessings from Yahweh from this crippled old man. And again, he blesses him twice, okay? Once when he enters and then once when he leaves. And this isn't just some generic farewell and generic greeting. Um, this is the elder statesman of God's people, the last of the great patriarchs of the Old Testament, Yahweh's chief representative on earth blessing this foreign king. And then in between these blessings, we see Jacob's lament, right? He, he laments that his life has been short, which is kind of ironic, but at least in comparison to his ancestors, his life has been short and that his days have been evil. And so here you can imagine Jacob probably gives Pharaoh maybe a summation of some of the things that have or that at least he would consider to be, uh, you know, his evil days that have befallen him, right? His, his father refusing to give him his promised birthright, his brother trying to kill him, his uncle swindling him, his sons lying to him, sending his beloved Joseph into slavery. And this, I think, is one of the best arguments, actually, for Pharaoh's conversion to faith in Yahweh. So Pastor Nate has brought this up a couple times uh, throughout the, the Joseph narrative. Uh, and for some, it may, may be a bit of a stretch, right, to think that, that Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, converted to belief, to faith in Yahweh. But think about this. We have these two blessings. We have his opening blessing, and then Jacob laments all of the evil days of his life. And then the second blessing, and, and Pharaoh accepts the second blessing even after everything that Jacob has said. And so what we don't hear, what we don't see is Pharaoh stopping Jacob saying, you know, thanks for the blessing, Jacob. Um, but, you know, Ra kind of treats me and my priests a lot better than that. Like you can, you can keep Yahweh's blessing. We're probably fine. What I think is happening here is that Pharaoh realizes and accepts uh, he accepts this blessing because he realizes and understands Yahweh's purposes in all the evil of Jacob's life, right? Those purposes, those evil days in Jacob's life were what brought Joseph to Egypt so that he could bless Egypt and all the surrounding nations. So at the center of our text, this is where we're going to get our big idea. It's a simple one. It is simply that our central task as God's people is to be a blessing to the nations. 
Our central task as God's people is to be a blessing to the nations. That's it. This is the original promise given to Abraham by God, right? That God would bless Abraham, and not not just that God would bless Abraham, but it says that God blessed Abraham so that he would be a blessing to the nations. And so I guess the key to understanding how this applies to us is, you know, has this changed for us, right? We, we understand that Israel was to be a blessing to the nations. What's our job? Well, spoiler alert, it's exactly the same. Paul teaches uh, in various places in the New Testament that we are Christians, Abraham's true offspring. We are his offspring of faith. We are the true Israel, heirs according to the promise, a nation, a royal priesthood, all these things. And so God When he blesses us, he blesses us so that we may be a blessing to the nations. So to wrap up our story this morning, finish off chapter 47, we're going to see a specific uh, example of how Joseph does this very thing, kind of the, the pinnacle of Joseph being a blessing to the nation of Egypt. So this is going to be a fairly lengthy reading. We'll start in verse... 13. It says, Now there was no food in all of, all of the land, for the famine was very severe, so that, the land of Egypt, uh, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when the money was all spent, the land of Egypt Uh, In the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, and the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food. And we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for all the Egyptians sold their fields because the famine was severe on them. The land became Pharaoh's, and for the people he made servants of them, from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh, uh, from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, you shall sow the land. And the harvests, and at the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four fifths shall be your own, as seed for the field, and as food for yourselves and your households, and as food for your little ones. And they said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt. And it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. The land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now you have found favor, uh, if I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. Need a drink of water after that one. So this is actually a pretty controversial passage, believe it or not. Um, For many, it's very straightforward, um, and you know I won't say anything uh, shocking to you. But for some, uh, they do read a lot of negativity into Joseph's actions here. 
Right? Some people essentially see what Joseph has done and they read socialism or communism or statist power, statist, uh, you know, creep. Uh, and there's a, there, there are definitely lessons to be learned here. But I, I have difficulty seeing this as the intention of the author for a couple of reasons. First, the whole flow of the passage is that Israel, through Joseph, has become a blessing to the nations, not a curse. Secondly, it's simply an anachronistic reading, I think, of the text, right? In other words, we're reading back into ancient tribal cultures, systems of law and government uh, that are very modern and simply unheard of and kind of would have been utterly unthinkable to any of them. So how then did Joseph bless the nations? Well, in their own words, they said, you have saved our lives. That's a pretty good blessing. All right, so how did Joseph save their lives? Well, it was his wisdom, it was his counsel, it was his ability to interpret Pharaoh's dreams in the first place that put him in the position to store up enough food in Egypt to not only feed Egypt, but the surrounding nations for seven entire years of famine. The controversial part, I guess, is in the how. Right? Joseph saved their life, but at what cost? Um, first, they exchanged their wealth, their money for food. Okay, that seems reasonable. Um, but then when the wealth dried up, they exchanged their livestock for food. And then when the livestock ran out, they exchanged their land and themselves for food to live. They became servants, some translations, slaves to Pharaoh in exchange for food to live. So should Joseph have done this? This is kind of the big question of this passage. Should he have just given the food out and, and you know, given the food out freely, allowed the people to live? The problem is when we try to read a passage like this as a, uh, an ought instead of an is. Okay, I don't think we're actually, I don't think it's wise for us to see everything that Joseph did here and treat it as an ought for our time and our place Simply, it is what happened. This is not particularly a passage about political theology. This is a passage about how God, through an amazing, wild chain of circumstances, beginning with Joseph being sent into slavery in Egypt, used him to provide salvation for his people, as well as bless the surrounding nations through his wise actions. So, when I say this, I'm not saying that there's nothing to learn from this in terms of political theory, okay? There are many lessons we can learn from this. It's not our focus, and it's not something we're going to spend a bunch of time in, but just very quickly, right, we can see the, the good that a good, wise, godly ruler can do, right? He can literally save his people from starvation, save their lives, and then with that same amount of power, we can see what a wicked, ungodly king can do, right? Because in a couple chapters, at the start of Exodus, we're going to find that there's a new pharaoh, a pharaoh that does not know Joseph, does not know God, and he wields this same amount of power to do great wickedness. Okay, we can also learn a lesson from Joseph requiring people to pay for their food. He doesn't hand it out freely, and when they can't pay for it, they work for it. Novel idea. But that's what it means to be, in this passage, a servant or a slave to Pharaoh. The fact that Pharaoh owned 20%, right? Pharaoh gets a fifth. So Pharaoh owned 20% of their production. That was considered slavery. Essentially, a 20% income tax. So um, imagine what they would think of us now. Okay, so it's not, I'm, I'm serious, there, there are many lessons we can learn from this passage and many others in terms of political theory, political theology, it's just not the focus of this passage nor the focus of our text this morning, right? For these people, it was a giant step forward. They literally went from certain death to life. 
So God works progressively in history, right? In, in this situation that Joseph put them in, um, it's not something that we would look back to and desire. Okay, I, I grant that. As new covenant believers, it would be a move backwards for us. But for them, it was a move forward, a blessing of life from certain death. So let's wrap up, though, pull out some application. We're going we're gonna to kind of tie in some of our earlier points to some quick application here about how we then can bless the nations, or maybe more uh, properly say, how does God, through us, bless the nations? Three really quick points. First, evangelize. The most important way that we can bless the nations is we evangelize them. This should be, hopefully, very obvious. We saw hints of it in, in this passage and in other passages in the Joseph narrative that Joseph has done this very thing, right? He, I believe, has evangelized Pharaoh And because of that, the policies and the decision-making of that nation has changed. And it's become a massive blessing for the nation of Egypt. Now, of course, most of us, likely none of us, will ever have the chance to share the gospel with heads of state. Um, But that's okay. Every person we share the gospel with has a circle of influence that they will then positively impact because they have become a new creation. It might not be the impact that, you know, the conversion of a king would have, but an impact nonetheless. And so for many people, this is, this is really difficult, sharing our faith to strangers, um, uh, even to people that we know very well. It can, be, it can be a very difficult thing. And so I would just encourage you, we, we talked about it in our announcements this morning. We have opportunities every single week to go out, learn from people who, who are amazing at this, to share the gospel with our neighbors here in London, here in Ingersoll, in Niagara next week, right? They'd love to see you. So evangelize. That's the first and foremost way that we bless the nations as God's people. Second, work in such a way that you will stand before kings. Work in such a way that you will stand before kings. Proverbs twenty two twenty nine says this very thing. It says, do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings kings. So if you can't evangelize and convert the head of a nation, what's the next best thing? Well, surround him with godly influences, godly wise counsel. Right? And how do those people get there? How do they get into positions like that? Well, like Joseph, they work skillfully in whatever that they do. Right? Joseph would never have been given the opportunity to stand before Pharaoh and request the best land in Egypt for his family to sojourn in if he had not worked skillfully for Potiphar, if he had not worked skillfully for the jailer, if he had not worked skillfully for Pharaoh himself. So the work that you do, no matter what it is, is a blessing in and of itself to the people around you, to your neighbors around you. Right? Even, if, even if those neighbors are toddlers pulling at your pant legs. But the most skillful among us have opportunities to have an exceptionally disproportionate, disproportionately large impact because very powerful people desire to have the very best around them at all times. And so we shouldn't assume that these positions are for pagans only. Right? We should actually assume because leadership flows to those who take responsibility, Christians are people who take responsibility more than anyone else, or at least they should. And so these positions of leadership, we should actually expect Christians to be in many of these high places. We shouldn't assume that just because somebody seeks a high position in government or business or anything like that, that they're compromised. Right? The temptations are there, that's true, and the temptations are, are numerous, But we should seek them out. We should encourage those who do this because it's a great opportunity to bless the nations, right? You can have a disproportionate impact because of your high position and you get there by working skillfully. So work in such a way that you will stand before kings. Third, lastly, promote just laws. Okay, aside from true heart conversion of an individual, There is no greater blessing for a human being than to live under the blessing of God's righteous law. Okay, so we live in 
Canada here, and we have been blessed for generations because of the biblical law codes that have been set up by our forefathers, right? From all the way back to King Alfred, to the English common law, to the Puritans. And so we still have residual benefit because of those great men. Even though, right, our political systems, our culture is seeking to uh, sort of stamp out and remove God's influence uh, in every single bit of law and legislation that they can get our fingers on. But our nation is still being blessed to this day because of their influence. But like Joseph, we should push for the next right thing. Right? We shouldn't wait for a political Messiah to simply fall out of heaven and fix all of our problems at once. Um, we should see the needs. We should push for just biblical laws wherever we can. We should promote leaders who fight for them. Right? Things won't be perfect. Um, in fact, if we look around, that's pretty obvious uh, that things are not perfect right now. But as with Joseph's life, okay, like he did, we evangelize, we work heartily unto the Lord, we promote justice in the area of law and order, and then we pray that years from now, people will see that what they meant for evil, God meant for good. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you um, that you are a God who is so infinitely beyond anything we could possibly fathom. The, the way that you work the tapestry of history um, is uh, impossible for our finite minds to comprehend. It simply seems like a, a jumbled mess to us, and yet your purposes are accomplished every single second of every single day. And so we would simply ask that uh, you would allow us to be a part of your purposes on earth, um, that we would show the faithfulness of Joseph to do the right thing, even when all hope seems lost, uh, as it does today, uh, that we could be a part of your plan to bless all the nations of the world uh, through your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.